All right, cool. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, obviously in these pictures, the badge doesn't look like uh, any of the other badges, at least that I've seen. I'm, I know we've done something like this, or not we, but people have done kind of wristbands before, but I think this one's kind of very different. I didn't mean for it to look like a medical band, and that's kind of, I don't know, like with this whole virus thing, it kind of applies, but um, I don't know. I'll talk a little bit more about- Are you, uh, yeah. are you ready to go? Yes, I am. You can't hear, you can't hear me? Hold on a minute. Let me. No, uh, you're you're good. We'll just mute Bryce. Keep going. <laughs> okay, so you can hear me. Yeah, you're good. All right. Okay, cool. So I'll just keep going. Um, I kind of want to give a little background on uh, what led to this badge. So this is a picture of me, uh, the one on the left. Uh, that's specifically, this is me at DEF CON, and that is all my badges I was wearing at DEF CON, and I kind of felt a little like. Mr. T, right, with all my like bling going on there. And like, you know, I mean, the rock is heavy and then some of those other badges and all their batteries, it started to add up. I kind of felt like a backpacker, my neck just, you know, just hanging on me there. So that was kind of one inspiration is I wanted to do something lighter than the, the usual neck chain. Um, one of those badges I got there was the DEF CON China badge, which is really kind of cool. It's a flexible PCB badge with these little lights that'll blink on the side. And I thought, that's really cool. I wanna to try to do something with flexible PCB, but I'm not sure what. And then the, uh, the third kind of designing factor that I wanted to hit was uh, based on last year's badge. So I'm not sure as many of you were here last year, but um, in my talk, I described how I totally screwed up and ordered a processor when I went for the final fab. I had a wrong part number and that basically ended up with me ordering a processor that was one third as powerful as what I designed everything for, which led to some really crazy two weeks of reprogramming and redesigning to try to get everything to run on a really tiny processor. And that was really painful at the time, but after breathe sites was all kind of done and I, and I kind of had a chance to breathe, I was like, man, that was kind of fun squeezing as much as I could out of a processor. I felt kind of like one of the biggest loser coaches at but like for processors also, right? Like, no, you have to do this on this little bit of energy or power or whatever you had. And I kind of wanted to do that again, but this time instead of on a, on a lower processor, I wanted to do it on power. I wanted to run on as little power as possible. Um, so those were my three real designing goals, flexible PCB, something not heavy around the neck and very low power. Um, so I was just kind of chewing on those and I came across one of these Dick Tracy comics, and I was like, oh, that is it. That's what we're gonna do. So that's kind of what I designed this around. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen this video on Twitter already, but um, basically in a nutshell, the watch is a functional watch, or the badge is a functional watch. Um, there's a text-based adventure game built into it. Um, the pay, it's an e-paper display, a 3D printed case around the size, um, on the bottom, there's some snap, a snap button that we can resize or size initially to your wrist. Um, it's also a USB mass storage drive, a CD serial, and there's, there's a lot more going on as well on the badge uh, that I, I don't want to reveal at this time. So like I said, the backside, there's uh, adjustable snaps. Um, this is kind of part of the reason we decided against trying to ship everything is that these snaps require this special little tool to set the snap. And I didn't want to set the snap just based on what you tell me your wrist size is. It would have been easier. I plan to do this at the conference after you got your badge. You just kind of come over and get the snap that matches your wrist, you know, put the snap on that matches your wrist size. But uh, things didn't work out quite as planned there. Uh, here's kind of the, uh, the design flow of the badge. Uh, the top left is my initial prototype that I wore around for a few days. My kids were very embarrassed as I wore this uh, piece of paper, pr pretend watch on my wrist as we went everywhere. Um, after I kind of proved that, okay, initially this, this might actually work, uh, I went for the, the prototype on the breadboard down below. Um, that was my test setup. You can see my multimeter hooked up all along the way. I had to be very conscious of how much power the whole system was using. Uh, in that screenshot, it's showing it's using three milliamps, which what, that's when it's typically running. And then my first prototype is, is in the center of the screen. Um, I kind of had some mistakes. That's why there's this little yellow wire. I, afterward, I had to kind of uh, solder that to fix some of my wiring errors. I have to thank Kid for helping me uh, solder, or he helped me uh, put all the 
uh, SMB components on that badge so that I, I can actually have my first prototype. Again, the two pins off the side are for measuring power usage. And then the, the two in the end are the final production run, one with the 3D case and one without the 3D case. So just talk a little bit about the hardware that went into this. Um, it's based around a 32-bit stem processor that's designed to use very little power. It's the whole band itself is a flexible PCB band. Um, we have an e-paper display. It does have a, a rechargeable LiPo battery on it. Uh, so if you, whenever your USB plug it in, that'll charge it, charge it up. Um, the watch on its own should last about 10 days without a charge. So, I mean, charge it every day, every other day, whatnot, and keep, it'll keep the battery running just fine. The accelerometer, uh, flash storage, there's a real-time clock. Um, kind of wanted to talk about the flexible PCB. I don't feel like that's something that's done very much. Oh, I, I forgot to mention earlier, questions, please just throw them in the Q&A, and then if there's time at the end, I'll get to them there. Um, I just won't, I won't interrupt myself as I'm going, so I'll hit those if there's time at the end. But anyways, flexible PCB, I've seen it used once or twice for badges, and I wanted to try it and see how well it works. It's really kind of cool, right? Like, what badges can you bend and twist like that? However, it does have its drawbacks, and I'm not sure I would do something like this for a badge again. Um, just so you know, if you're a badge designer, you're thinking about this, um, there's a few issues that you face. One, this picture in the top left, or top right, is one of my early prototype boards testing out uh, NFC. And as I would pop and pop that off, pop it on and pop it off the breadboard, it put stress on the flexible PCB, which led to those traces cracking. And so when the traces cracked, I had to solder one of those little yellow jumper wires to replace the broken trace. And then I'd use it and another one would break. And so those three yellow wires are because three different traces on the flexible PCB just would break during the, what I considered regular use. So it, it bends, but it also breaks. And so you wanna kind of limit the amount of bend or in critical places, the cut type of bend. Another picture, another thing is the uh, picture just below that. I was initially planning to use some double-sided kind of film rubber underneath the flex screen and the components and just kind of give that kind of padding there. But um, it turns out that double-sided tape actually, when you would bend, it started pull components off the flexible PCB. You can kind of see in that picture, the battery leg is been, has been ripped off the flexible PCB. So in the end, I had to determine a way to keep the flexible the screen moving independent of the board, but without the flexible screen being um, exposed a lot. Um, so that battery that you see in the center there, that is a LiPo battery, and it has, it holds 40 milliamps. So to put 40 milliamps in perspective, one of those little coin cell batteries is, holds six times as much as one of these rechargeable batteries. And those coin cells, right, like you can power an LED for like a day on them. They're not very much. And so to consider we have one sixth of that is a real limiting factor. Uh, I toss, initial design, I toss, I'll toggle back and forth between wanting that coin cell or a rechargeable. And like the rechargeable, you could recharge, obviously. The coin cell, you could just replace after so long. Um, ultimately, I obviously went with rechargeable, mainly because it was just such a pain to get to that location, and I didn't want everyone to have to take their badge clear apart just to replace the battery. So I just assumed, yeah, everybody around us probably has a PC. They can probably charge this at least every other day, so I'm gonna go with rechargeable route. Um, for some comparison though, to work on 40 milliamp hours for what I can plan on a 48 hour conference, I had to really cut down on power usage. So I'm, I have side by side here this graph showing what last year's badge, how much it used in each state, and how much initial capacity I had to work with compared to this year. And across the board, it's, it's you know about a 10th. It starts to drop as the, the different states go. So uh, just the, the sleep is when you're not active, it's just kind of sitting there. And then standby is in, was not a state in the last year's badge. Standby is almost everything off. The processor shuts down, all it's doing is keeping track of time, which presented some of its own issues because uh, when the processor shuts down, all of the memory is wiped. So I had to kind of save enough state so that as soon as you pressed a button, you could return to exactly the same screen and exactly the same place in the game you were 
to make it look like to the user, it never turned off, right? But um, the whole processor, the memory, the buff, frame buffer, everything is wiped. Um, but to see in standby, uh, we're using, that's 25 micro amps. Um, it, it's really, it's really kind of cool to see that, that it actually worked in the end. So the flexible e-paper display, I thought was the coolest thing when I saw it online. Um, I really, I really am enameled with, or I, I don't know the right word, I'm, I'm a country hick. I really like the uh, e-paper displays. I think they're the coolest thing in that you can just set the display once and it takes zero power to maintain that. Um, it's very low power and it looks very crisp. And the flexible was just on top of that, just even better, or so I thought. Um, I only found one manufacturer that would make flexible e-paper displays. And it turns out the reason I, in my mind, the reason that not many people do it is because they're not as flexible as they seem. If I try to do what they're showing in this picture with here, I ended up with a broken display. And in fact, after the production, I ended up with many broken displays. These are all in the screenshot displays that failed in some way or another and were not suitable for the badge. Uh, that became a really sore point at, at final stage of production is that I had to find a way to protect these better than I was and that they are just not very flexible. Um, they don't take any kind of beating, any touching. They don't like the event, even though they're claimed to be flexible. So when you get your badges, if you don't take anything else away from this talk, please take away the screens are really, really flexible or really not that flexible. They're really fragile. Um, so if you press on the screen or you smash it against something, it's going to break and we really don't have a lot of extras because I went through most of the extras. So when you get your badge, it's flexible, yes, but don't push it. Just, just be, be gentle, be gentle. Okay, so to, to help mitigate some of those uh, flexible issues, I designed a 3D, print, a 3D printable case. Um, here I have two videos I'm gonna show. One is the design process and the other is the printing process of one of those. I'll kick them off of the both, both at the same time. But um, it was kind of kind of fun. I don't do much 3D printing, so this was a good opportunity to build something that I felt was slightly useful. We went to a 3D printing company to have these printed after I did my test one runs, and turned out that their margin of error was a lot higher than I expected. So some of the frames don't fit together as snugly as I would have liked. But um, I am releasing the STL files for this. So if you'd like to print your own case, I imagine. All the ones that I printed fit well, very well. And I imagine if you print your own, it would probably fit even better than the ones that it came with. But even still, the ones that it came with are just fine. It's just kind of a perfectionist thing. So the software or the firmware, I used um, STEM Cube IDE to build all this, which provides this really cool kind of interface on the side here. You can just assign pins and it shows you graphically, okay, this pin is assigned to this. This is what you've got left. Um, it also builds out a lot of the code or the, the stub code for you. And so that was really nice to work with. Uh, as you can see from this screenshot, I'm using almost all the pins, the three gray pins down in the bottom corner, the only three pins of that processor I'm not using. And then below that, it shows the flash space. I'm using 92% of it. Um, and that's after pulling a lot of dialogue and game code onto the, uh, the flash chip that I'm using the external flash chip, and then I'm also using a lot of RAM. I have to use a lot of RAM because the e-paper display takes two buffers. Um, when you're doing a partial refresh on the e-paper, it takes one, one buffer, you have to pass it what the screen currently is, and then you pass it what you want it to be so that it can do a kind of a ping pong and um, come up with it. So a double, kind of a double buffered frame for this e-paper display. Um, after initially building everything, there was one bug that really annoyed me, and that was after about a week of the watch running, it would fall behind about four minutes. And debugging was really painful. When I would debug it while the processor was running, it was beautifully keeping track of time down to the microsecond. It was very precise. Um, but um, the processor would shut off, right? And then turn back on and update the time. And I can't debug a processor that's off. Like I, there's just no debugging of it, it's gone. And when it would come back up, it would somehow, somewhere, it was a few microseconds behind every time it would come back up. And I couldn't figure out what that issue was. Well, it turns out during a reinitialization, as the processor would reboot, it would, I had it re-initting the real-time clock. And when it would re-init it, 
there would be that 20 millisecond loss that occurs once every minute because it updates the screen every minute. And that time compounded, you know, 60 times an hour, 24 times a day for seven days ended up being about three to four minutes of time loss. And so fixing that one bug resolved this complete issue, but finding that bug, bug was extremely painful. Um, another issue I had is uh, during the course of the game, you will unlock files or case content, and that will be available to you on the USB drive. But um, I wanted a way to not have those files be available until you unlock them. And I, but the problem was is I didn't have anywhere else to store the files. Like that flash space was the space I had to store these files. So I needed a way to have them only appear when they were available. And um, I was just thinking, okay, well, I'll just you know, modify the file list and only show the files that I want to be there. But the problem is, is a USB uh, command, a storage device, doesn't speak like directory listings, it speaks raw SCSI commands, like show me this sector, you know, give me the contents of this sector, give me the contents of this sector. So my solution for this is I actually designed a semi, I don't know, you, I considered it a rootkit, but basically I'd interrupt sector calls for the file allocation table and modify the file, the FAT table, sorry, that's the FAT, to um, only show the, the file listings that I wanted to appear. The, the actual data is on the sectors, but only that file allocation table is modified. And if the machine doesn't know the files there, then it just assumes there's no data there. Um, that is something that may come in handy during the puzzles, just to know that fact that the uh, data is there, but the file allocation table is being mucked with. So the theme for this game is a uh, DFIR. Last year's theme was kind of an attacker, kind of a pen tester, more the puzzles were more geared around that. These puzzles are more geared around the defender. I think that fits in well with kind of a, a Dick Tracy detective type um, theme. So all these puzzles, there, there's like packet carving, there's some reverse engineering. I promise I'm a lot easier than last year's. Um, malware analysis, disk imaging, steganography. There's a lot of DFI, what I would consider DFIR basic skills. Um, that are built into this. Uh, I do. I did kind of try to build them to challenge you somewhat, but I didn't want you to have to spend, a, uh, they should all be do doable in one day. So they should be that rough of puzzles. But uh, at least if anything, they should get you an entry into DFIR if you've never done this thing kind of before. As the badge is running, it'll have, it has a little LED on it that will occasionally blink four times. And those four blinks represent your game state, how far along you are. They'll, initially, it'll just blink four red lights, which kind of means you've done nothing. And the goal is to get it to, a, to four blue lights. When you've got four blue lights, you've made it all the way through the puzzle. Um, the puzzle does kind of play into a story that you were, are kind of solving. And I didn't want it to be linear. I wanted it to be so that you could work on multiple puzzles at one time. Um, so this is my kind of logic chart. I've kind of blinked everything out. But um, I wanted it to be like, if you're stuck on one puzzle, that's all right. There's like five others you can be working on until you kind of narrow yourself down to the end. And then it, it draws into one line. So this chart, it flows actually left to right. Right being the final goal, that little green box says finish. And um, any green box on the left is a, is a puzzle that's able to be solved from the get-go. And then they just kind of chain along from there. So you've got, you've got multiple paths you can work until you reach the finish line. I took a lot of design theme from a really old uh, Macintosh game called Deja Vu. I'm not sure it's worth going, worth going back and playing yourself. It, it doesn't hold up to the test of time very well, but I thought it was really cool how they got so much with just a monochrome display and the, just the story that they were able to build into it. So I, I took a lot of um, um, inspiration from this as well. Here are a few screenshots from badge gameplay. A lot of these you've probably seen in, in videos. I didn't want to reveal a lot more than already has been revealed. Um, but as you play, you will be able to find things, pick up clues, use items you've picked up. And um, as like uh, in the picture in the top right, uh, this you just this dialogue, something happens, you talk to this guy and he seems to, he has now added this file to your case file. So then you can plug in your USB drive, you have access to that file, you can do analysis on it and then use that analysis to open up more game path. It kind of toggles back and forth like that throughout the game. And that's, how am I doing on time? I talk kind of fast. Okay, I'm about out of time, so this is good. 
All right, so I have just a few items of administration since uh, this won't be available. Um, I sorry, one of the I don't know when the badges will be able to be handed out. I, I'm leaving that up to the board, right, to the side. They're the ones in charge. Whenever that is, I do plan to be there, and I'd love to see how this works um, in person. I will once this is all done. Post the the source code and all the files, the images, the scripts I use to compile everything to the link below, but I'm keeping that repository private until after that date. Um, also, this little badge, oh, so on the badge, there's a, a little programming header that you just plug into, and this little green box is what I use to program it, to interact with it, to, to debug it, whatever. And um, I have a few of those, so the first so many people that are able to completely solve the badge, I plan to give them one of those along with a mini breadboard and some wires to kind of help them get started. And then all the code will be released. So if you want to reprogram this to do something else, you know, go for it. It, it, it has a real time clock, it has an accelerometer, so you can make it like a pedometer. I, you know, there's, I feel like there's a lot that could be done here and m many things that I'm just not even thinking of. So I'd like to hear what eventually in the future, what you guys do with this. Um, so to initially set the date, uh, I have a, I decided to put a switch on this and, and I'm glad I did. There's a power switch. Most watches don't have a power switch, right? They're always on. But I did put a power switch on this, so the watch is completely off until you get it. That'll mean there will, the battery won't be dead. Um, and as soon as you turn it on, it'll start keeping track of time, but obviously time will be off. So you set the time via an NFC uh, NDEF tag. And um, you just can format it like I did there, just say date, semi, date colon and then the date you want and the next time it reads that NFC or the next time the badge is actually on if you just press a button it'll turn on or it'll just turn on the next minute but as soon as it turns on it'll read that and set the time appropriately um, I wanted to give a special thanks to the b-side staff uh, they've been really great trying to do the best they can with all of this they really I really appreciate being able to make these badges it's a lot of stress but I do kind of enjoy it and obviously I uh, Comfort Kid Mike, I mentioned him before, but he helped me a lot, at least with all the hardware, getting it soldered down. And I think I bounced a question or two off of hardware design with him. And I really appreciate his help on the matter. So with that, I'm sure there's items or questions I missed. Um, if you have any, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A. I see, I see one now. Um, it says, if I didn't buy a badge with my ticket, are there extras that will be for sale? I'm not sure the answer to that. I believe the answer is yes. That's a question for Bryce. So I will, I will poke him afterward to see where Ticket Sales is at. And um, maybe he can, I can have him make a comment in the uh, a Slack page on that one. Um, any other questions? There's one in the chat. Um, it says, are we gonna get an email or something notifying us when you post it to the URL, when you make your GitHub public? Um, I guess that's possible. I. I, I don't have access to that email list, but I could definitely paste that link on to the staff and the staff could probably do that. Um, hey, Waylon, it's, it's Bryce. So uh -huh. yes, he can answer yeah. those questions. Yeah, we can, we can push out an email. Um, another thing that I just want to, you know, we always push out the content on Twitter and the Slack channel as well. Um, so the Twitter and Slack are usually the best places to get updates. Right. And then yeah, I'm happy to push out an email um, whenever that codes online. So, and then, if we have extra badges, we definitely want to get rid of them. Um, so, you know, we'll we'll talk about what that means. Um, I'm hope I'm hopeful we can have a meetup later in the year. Uh, and you know, if we do that, then we'll figure out how many we have working and sell off the rest of them. Um, but uh, we definitely want to make sure that the people who have already purchased them get them first, right? So. All right. Cool. Um, seeing if there's any. I think that's it, right? We've hit everything. Okay, well, I appreciate your time. I'm really curious to see what you think. If we should just stick with tr more of a traditional badge or you think this was a cool idea. Um, yeah, thank you guys very much for attending. Appreciate it.